extend a warm welcome to Miss Aurora Taylor Rojas. Well, I would thank you, but you made that joke about my age, so, <laughs> so I'm not going to thank you. No, thank you for the warm welcome. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here. Can you guys hear me okay with this mic? Okay, so um, really a great pleasure to, um, to be here. It's not often that um, a Vice President of Engineering gets to talk to this many students. Um, in one room, and so I, I'm really thankful to, to have been invited. Um, I'll start off by saying I was a little suspicious. Um, so when Doug said to me, you know, BYU wants you to come and speak, I thought, well, I didn't go to BYU. I went to another school. You might have heard of it. They have a good football team. It's in a big city, <laughs> so I am a University of Utah alumni. That is not why I'm wearing red, as my BYU alumni brother pointed out uh, with the blue tie. Um, I'm wearing red because it's Valentine's Day. Uh, so, um, so, so I really did think, well, how's this going to go? You know, is there going to be like a mob fight or something? Because because I'm here at BYU. And so I was a little worried, I'm going to be honest. And so I did what, uh, what any adult professional woman would do when they're a little nervous. I invited my mom. <laughs> and you'll understand why I invited my mom. I actually invited everyone I know that has come to BYU. And they're sitting right here. There's four of them, three of them, uh, my family. Um, so you'll, you'll see in a few minutes, I'm getting ahead of myself, that they actually have some pretty strong ties, not only to this institution, uh, but to Provo, to Provo, Utah. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so um, as, as the introduction stated, I'm an electrical engineer, and I work at L3 Technologies. Um, I've been there for 25 years, um, so I guess the age joke was pretty appropriate. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about diversity of experience, which is kind of interesting since I've been at the same company for 25 years. So you might be asking yourself, you know, if you're this expert in, in, in experiences and diversity of experiences, how is it that I've stayed with the same company for 25 years? Um, and you guys are about to find out there's actually a very strong correlation there. We're going to try this out. So that is what I've been up to for 25 years. Um, tried to sneak in some mechanical engineering content just for you. Um, so what you'll see and what I want to talk about is 
Not all of this is going to be about engineering, but, but there is a lot of things. I was talking with your deans this morning. Technology is moving so fast and engineering as a field is moving so fast that it's no longer, uh, it's no longer true that any of us can focus on one skill set or on one discipline. Um, it used to be a little bit like that. Um, you know, you could be a software engineer and code your entire career and code your entire life um, and make a great career of it. And you can still do that. Um, but I'd like to offer you a different, a different way of looking at it and maybe some different alternatives. Um, so a lot of the video you saw is what we do at L3 Technologies. We, we design and build um, and deploy wideband communication systems for the Department of Defense. So we employ all sorts of different talent, RF engineers, software engineers, mechanical engineers, systems engineers, a ton of testing, manufacturing, you name it. We need it and we need that talent. So, so I want to talk about diversity of experience, right? Not just engineering, but for, as it ties into engineering and as it ties into my experience, it's almost impossible for me to talk about my path and how I got here without talking about what I've done in my career because it's what I've, it's, I've grown up as an engineer and I've grown up in this company. Um, so for all of you in the, in the audience, I know we have a, a, a very diverse group of technical skill sets. Um, I'd like to show you a few things. So for the mechanical, uh, see I even put that slide first. <laughs> for the mechanical engineers in the room, um, you're studying thermal analysis, you're studying structures, you're studying vibration, you know, you're doing all sorts of neat things. But I'd like to, I'd like to have you consider doing something. We were talking about this uh, over breakfast with, with your deans. Um, there is just an explosion of technology going on in the mechanical engineering field. It is a super, super exciting field to be in. I'm not a mechanical engineer, but when I started uh, at L3, the mechanical engineers didn't really do anything too exciting. Here we are, you know, about 10 or 15 years later, some of the most innovative and some of the most exciting technologies in my, in my team are coming from the mechanical engineering department. We're studying uh, additive manufacturing, thermal management, we're working with research labs like DARPA. So what I'd like you all to consider, regardless of the field that you're studying is, you know, have something that you're passionate about and be a subject matter expert in that field, whether it be mechanical engineering or electrical, but then expand your experience because no longer, no longer do we build something just based on one technology. Mechanical engineers need to understand coding, need to understand software. Uh, software engineers, advanced communications engineers need to understand the packaging and the cooling and the vibration aspects that those of you that are studying mechanical. So it's really just about the strength and the power of how many tools you collect throughout your life, throughout your experiences, and throughout your professional career. Let's see if this, uh, you'll see here uh, a pretty neat simulation. The video on the right actually is a real shock test that we did on one of our antennas for the Navy. And the beauty of simulation, right, is that you should be able to reduce cost, uh, expense, schedules by simulating what you're about to design and build. So we've gotten really good at that where what we simulate and what we build and test are almost, almost identical with just a few little tweaks. That saves you cost, that saves you schedule, and that makes products safer. So now for the RF antenna engineer. So I was an RF design engineer earlier part of my career. So it's the best field to go into, if you guys are still debating that, right, Mr. Keller? Um, um, but again, it's the same concept, right? We've had people, and I've known people, I've worked with people, your father, that you know, spent their entire career and designing antennas or doing RF circuitry. What we're seeing more and more in industry and what, we're, what I would have you guys all consider is, if you are an antenna designer, that's fantastic. I thought I wanted to be an RF engineer my entire career. Um, but branch out to the different disciplines. Take an internship, perhaps, in a completely different field than the one you're specializing in, and that will just make you that much more powerful, that much more knowledgeable. But really the twist, and kind of what I, what I want to convey today is, it changes the way we think. 
when we expand our experiences, when we extend our understanding, whether it's professional or in life, it literally just widens your scope and your understanding of the world. You become better, you become more tolerant, you become smarter, and you have an ability to solve problems in a much more powerful way than, than if you stay in your little silo and in your little uh, area. I didn't know there was sound on that video. Nice job, Doug. So here we're showing um, some antenna pointing and tracking of the antennas that we design. We're pointing and tracking to satellites. Um, so we thought we'd throw that in with the antenna guys. Pretty sure Scott Lyon helped us with, with this. All right, so for the digital designers, I think all of you have to take some sort of analog and digital circuitry. I think where I went to school, it was Circuits 101. It was our, our preliminary bachelor's class. Um, what's, what's neat about, about where we work is we literally start with a concept. We don't always put it on a napkin like the picture shows. Sometimes it's a napkin, sometimes it's a whiteboard, you know, whatever it is you have. But it all starts with a concept, right? Once you have a concept, you can transform that to the electrical schematic. The powerful tools we have these days make the design cycle so much faster. From the schematic, you then go and we actually design our PCBs. We route our own PCBs. We don't build them, we outsource that, but we actually design in-house our own PCBs. I'll show you the circuit card. Now, when I went to college, DSP and wireless communications, that was considered a master's level, uh, level course. I don't know if that's what you guys do here. Um, this is kind of the heart and soul of a communication system, so it's kind of the heart and soul of what we do um, down in Salt Lake. Um, so as you can see, there's digital signal processing, forward error correction, modulation schemes, um, and currently, we're solving a lot of problems that have to do with the dynamic spectrum, if you see this. So spectrum is something that is finite. There's only so much spectrum in the world, and it is completely congested. So a lot of our algorithms and a lot of our work are figuring out adaptive ways to move out of the spectrum of communication. When you're being jammed, it can be friendly jammer, it can be non-friendly jammer. You have to have the ability to still communicate in a very congested environment. And I wouldn't be a good comms engineer if I didn't show you a modulation scheme for me. This one's for, for Dr. Rice. And last but not least, I'm not a software engineer, uh, but I need software engineers. So last but not least, um, we are really growing in the software field. Um, computer engineering, computer scientists, um, are in great demand. So any of you that are in that field, you're gonna have a wonderful career. Um, we do things for our products for the DOD um, that we call high-tech anthropology. We used to call that human factors. Is what you're building usable, right? Can the soldier actually hold it? Is it built right? Does it you know, play right? I'm sure Apple hires a lot of anthrop anthropology engineers to figure out exactly what the usability factor of the product that you're building is. Uh, we actually hire psychologists to help us with our products, if you can believe that. Um, artificial intelligence and machine learning, obviously a booming field um, that is growing in every single technology market. Um, so that is something that, that is really booming. So, those are the fields. Those are just the, the high-level fields. Um, as we talked about this morning, every single one of these fields, you know, has 20 to 30 subsets that you can specialize in, and that you can, uh, and that you can sp spend your entire career in. So, what I'd like to share with you is, you know, kind of my my trajectory in engineering and in my professional career. When I started designing RF circuitry, I thought there was nothing better in the world. 
It was so exciting. It was really hard. It was really challenging. We thought we were the coolest engineers. I'm sure we weren't, but we thought that. And the truth is that for the first five years of my career, it never even occurred to me that I would do anything else. Um, since then, I have been moved around and stretched and pulled, and I have had what a lot of people would argue is five or six different very varied careers in engineering with the same company. Um, so on that note, um, a couple of months ago, and I already knew that I was going to come and speak to you, but I had no idea what to tell you. I was having lunch with a colleague and a friend, and he asked me, he and his wife were debating schools for their young children. And him being an engineer, he said, Aurora, he said, don't you think that the most important thing for kindergarten <laughs> is, you know, mathematics and science? And I was like, no, I don't think. And then he said his wife was really interested in a dual immersion school for their children to just have that, that you know, that, um, that cultural uh, diversity. And, and he said, you know, you're from Mexico, you speak Spanish, you're also an engineer, you know, what's more important? Well, no one had ever quite asked me that. So then he said, what do you think got you to where you are in your career as vice president of engineering? The fact that you were really good at math or the fact that you speak Spanish? Well, <laughs> neither. <laughs> um, I said, that's a really stupid question. Um, John. <laughs> uh, but it did spark a really interesting uh, conversation that we had. And, and, and it kind of gave me a topic for today's talk. So it was, it was worth the breakfast. Because as I started thinking about that question, you know, why have I been so fortunate? Why have I had so many opportunities? You know, why do I get the privilege of leading a thousand person engineering department? You know, is it because I was really good at math or was it because I speak two languages? Well, it had nothing to do with either of those things. But as I thought back on it and on all of my experiences through my career, it is clear to me that the reason I've had the career that I have had and the life that I've had is because of the diversity of experiences that I've had. So this picture, I don't know if anyone recognizes where we are. You probably don't know who that is, but where we are is walking away from the, I think the, where do people graduate at BYU? The Marriott Center, thank you. I think we're walking away from the Marriott Center. If you, you can tell probably by the hair and by the cars that most of you weren't born in 1976. <laughs> um, so the goofy kid with the, with the cap is me. Um, and that's my family. And that's my mother graduating from BYU. I'm looking at her, and I don't think she knew that was her. Did you know that was you? No. <laughs> Um, so in 1976, I think that's when you graduated, Mom. I would have been six. Um, we were living here in, in Provo, and my mother, as a single mother of five, uh, graduated, was her first degree of, of more to come, but she graduated from this institution. So I thought, I think I have some street cred if, you know, if my mom went to BYU. Um, and then I actually thought that might be why they invited me. Um, so that's what I want to talk to you about um, today. So we, I was born in Mexico in 1970, and when I was five years old, my mother was raising us as a single mother. I'm the youngest of five, and uh, I think she got an internship opportunity to move from Mexico to Provo, of all things, to translate for IBM. And so she packed us in a car, five kids, and we drove from Mexico City to Provo, there to, we lived in an apartment complex called the Park Place, which I think still is close here. And I don't remember a lot about it because I was only five, but I do remember they had a swimming pool and a candy machine. And so my mom worked all day translating for IBM. I'm pretty sure you threw us in English school or something. But we got to swim every day, and I uh, had a quarter every day to get candy, so, so I fell in love with Provo very, very quickly. Um, so what happened then, the 10, 15 years after that, as I was growing up as a youth, is 
we moved back and forth. I've lived in between, between Utah and Mexico my whole life. I've lived in a lot of cities. I've lived in a lot of different states, um, di di between different parents and between different cultures, really. Um, and that just, I, I thought everyone did that. <laughs> it wasn't until later I realized that maybe wasn't everyone's normal, but it was my normal. The other thing that was my normal is I just assumed we all had to go to college because of this picture, because of this lady. Like, I, there was no option for us. You went to college, right? If, if, if she did, went to college with five kids, we were all gonna go to college. We were gonna get at least one degree. Um, what I have found as I have, as I have grown up and traveled the world and met a lot of people is not everyone has that experience. You know, that's not everyone's privilege to go to college and to get an education and to, and to have that foundation. Um, so we are all extremely fortunate. All of you are sitting here because you get to go to college. Um, my mother grew up in a very conservative uh, Mexican family. She was the only girl. She had three brothers, and her father didn't think women needed to go to college. So it was certainly not her normal. Um, she had to leave home, have five babies before she could go to college. Um, but it was not something that was encouraged for her. It wasn't something that she was, you know, even allowed to do. But the three brothers were encouraged to go to college. So as you, you know, so as you move around the world and as you travel and as you, you know, widen your, your view, not just technology, not just your studies, but your world view, um, you will all very quickly, if you haven't already, figure out normal doesn't mean anything. You know, don't let anyone define your normal. There is no normal. You get to define what your normal is. And the more experiences you have and the more things you do, the more people you meet, the more different people you surround yourself with, um, your normal will be fabulous. It will be really, 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 uh, really fun. We probably don't need to look at this. We'll look at this instead. Um, so that's my background. Um, so because I was bouncing around back and forth between schools, uh, between countries, um, I also had, I tried to count the number, of, the number of junior highs and high schools that I went to, um, and I couldn't really figure it out. Um, so I would like to stand here and tell you that that was just my diversity of education that I was after, but the truth is, is I was a little rebellious as a, as a teenager, and I got kicked out of a lot of schools. Um, in fact, when I was invited to speak here today, I texted my family and I said, hey mom, do you wanna go to BYU? They've invited me to speak. And she said, huh, that's really funny. And there were years we didn't even think you'd graduate from college. <laughs> what a treat. <laughs> Which is true. Um, so that, uh, that diversity of education, I like to say, was my, my early leadership training, right? I was, I was questioning everything. I was pushing every boundary. Um, so we'll call it that. We'll call it early, early leadership. Um, so I came back. And um, when I came back here, I wanted to be an educator. I studied special education at the University of Utah. Um, all of my family, I have, there's no engineers in my family. I come from a family of educators, artists, very creative people, um, and social work, you know, people that serve, people that love to help their community. They're all sitting on the front row, in case you want to meet them. Um, and so I just grew up wanting to be a teacher. I, you know, I thought that was what I was going to do, and I was really excited about being a teacher. Um, but again, that diversity of experience, and life happens, and you do different things, and Maybe sometimes your first choice uh, doesn't always fit who you really want to be. So you go explore your second and your third choice. Uh, my second choice was physics. And uh, it was my physics professor at the University of Utah that encouraged me to go into electrical engineering. Um, so here I am. I have a bachelor's and a master's degree from the U. Go Utes! No? Anyone? <laughs> I didn't think so. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and then I started working in 1994 as an intern at L3 Communications. We had a different name back then, and we have had various names, mergers, acquisitions, name changes, but essentially it's the same company, just a different name. In fact, we're about to go through another name change and another merger. 
and a whole other set of uh, diverse experiences are coming our way. So, um, so as this as this conversation with this colleague about you know how did you become a leader? How did you how did you progress and you know break away from the technical world to the leadership world? Um, again, was a very non-traditional path for me. Um, my previous boss, a friend and a mentor, likes to tell the story that every job I've ever had and every promotion he's ever given me, he either had to trick me into it or force me into it. Um, and there's some truth to that. I think as engineers, you guys know this, we like to perfect things. We like to just, it's a very black and white. You, you wanna be the best at your trade. You wanna be the absolute best at what you do. Um, so that lends itself to, to kind of you know, doing one thing. Does not necessarily lend itself to a diverse background, to different ways of looking at things. So it's not, it's not human nature, and it's certainly not human nature for engineers um, to you know, reach out um, to things that scare us or you know, break away from our comfort zone. So I've been super fortunate to have mentors and bosses and colleagues and, and friends and family that have always done that, you know, helped me with that, pushed me out. Um, one of the things, if, if you remember anything from this talk, um, I'd like you to remember this. You know, if you surround yourself with those people that are constantly challenging your, the way you look at the world, the way you think, the way you experience, um, you will grow so much faster and you'll experience so much more because they're seeing the world from a completely different perspective than you're seeing it. Um, in my case, uh, I, I had mentors and friends and colleagues that have seen my potential years before I even believed it was there. Um, so trust those people. You know, trust those people, whether they're your professors, your advisors, your friends. Um, right now, because I'm a lot further in my career, I still get inspired and I still see things differently and I still change the way that I view things. Less from my colleagues now, because we're all getting a little bit set in our ways, and less even in my bosses, but where I still get that inspiration and where I still get the, the different diversity of thought is from the younger generations, you know, the younger kids that are coming. Um, in fact, I don't want to embarrass her, but I might, I might need to tell you guys the story. Um, so as managers, we normally look at a ton of resumes. We bring in interns all of the time. It's, it's a great program for students. It's a great program for employers. We get to test drive you before we decide we want to invest in you. Um, so it's kind of a great program. And I was telling the deans this morning, uh, we traditionally only looked at juniors and seniors in college for internships and to come into to work for us because you got, you know, juniors and seniors have a little bit more of the fundamentals behind them. They can actually apply them to industry. We never looked at sophomores. We never looked at freshmen. They, you know, they just didn't have uh, enough experience. They just didn't have that. And uh, what we've seen is every generation is faster. Every generation, you guys, are smarter. And I'm not just saying that, because I'm talking to a bunch of students. It is amazing what you see in this field. Um, literally, the innovation, the speed. And I think it has a lot to do with the diversity of thought. I think because kids are growing up with computers and technologies, their bra your brains are literally acting differently and absorbing differently than our brains did when we were your age. So we're seeing this as employers, and we're seeing this as we're hiring and recruiting. And so all of a sudden, we're looking at sophomore resumes, even though we never brought in sophomores. It's like, well, this resume is pretty impressive, so we'd bring in a sophomore. And lo and behold, it was an excellent fit, and it was an excellent match. Um, so about 18, was it 18 months ago, there was a resume um, floating around. Um, and uh, there's a young lady in the audience. It was her resume. And uh, I remember it came to, it came to me, and uh, I was like, oh, come on. A senior in high school? Like, <laughs> no. <laughs> We're not doing that. Like, come on. You know, that's, 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 that's just too young. You know, this, this candidate won't even have a good experience. Because what can she possibly know from an engineering perspective as a senior in high school? Well, we brought her, they sent me the resume. 
you know, they sent me their resume and I was blown away. We were all blown away. All of the hiring directors were like, who is, you know, who is this unicorn? Um, you know, it was, we'd never seen a resume like that and she was still in high school. Um, so I'm a little jealous because you guys stole her from me because uh, she's now a student here. She's on the third row. Hi, Laura. Your dad says hi. Uh, and she's, she's now a freshman here at BYU. Um, we brought her in, again, never in the history of my 25 years have we brought in um, someone that young for an internship. And, uh, you know, I think it took two weeks and she was already producing and testing in the lab. She was in our software test group. Um, but that's how we're evolving, right? And for those of us that have been in the business for a long time, we're having to keep up with all of you. We're having to change the way we hire. We're having to change the way we communicate. Um, you guys are kind of keeping us on our toes um, as much as we're trying to offer opportunities and career paths. And, and I will tell you, it, it's, it's something we talk about as a staff. It's something that we have to adapt to because the world doesn't work the way it used to work when we were coming up. And so, um, so it's really inspiring. You're all in an amazing field. Um, you are all in a very marketable field. You will all have jobs. <laughs> you can all have jobs with me if you leave me your resume. Um, but, um, but I do wanna just share that with you, that the more, the more you reach out outside of your comfort zone, the more you get different perspectives, and it doesn't have to be just in your profession. You know, in everything that you do, um, you will really have a great success, and you will really have um, a lot of amazing opportunities. Um, last but not least, um, I'll leave this to you. I'm, I wanna read you this story. Um, we are talking a lot about innovating and changing the way we operate and the, the, the dynamics of engineering and how fast it's changing. So just recently, about, about a month ago, um, one of our mechanical engineers, Jared Campbell, sent me this story. He knew I was going to speak to you and he knew the topic. And he sent this story to me and he said, I think you should read this to the students at BYU. So I'm going to share this story. Um, the story is the ceramics story um, from a book called Art and Fear. Has anyone here read that? Yeah, I'd never heard of it either. I don't think it's an engineering book. <laughs> Maybe you've heard of it. Okay, so let me read you this story. I think it's really, it will really kind of tie everything together. A ceramics teacher announced on the first day of class that he was dividing the class into two groups. One half of the class would be graded solely on the quantity of the work that they produced, while the other half would be graded solely on their quality. Uh, so a 50 pound for the quantity people, a 50 pound pot would be a grade A. If it was only 40 pounds, it was a grade B, and so on and so on. But those being graded on quality, they only had to produce one pot. Didn't matter what it weighed, one pot. Uh, but it had to be a perfect pot in order to get a, an A. If it was less than perfect, you might get a B. So they went off to do their, their tasks. Come grading time, a very curious fact emerged. The works of highest quality were all produced by the group that was being graded on quantity. It seems that while the quantity group was just busily churning pot after pot and piles of work as fast as they could, they were actually learning from their mistakes. They were learning from their experiences, right? The quality group had sat around and theorized about what perfection might look like. <laughs> but in the end, they ran out of time and they had very little to show for their efforts other than some grandiose theories and a really ugly pot. So whether it's business, whether it's sports, whether it's your life, whether it's your profession, and whether it's engineering, um, it's not the quest to achieve one perfect goal that makes you better. It's the skills that you develop from doing a volume of work. Focus on the repetitions that lead to your desired outcome. Focus on the iterations that come before the success. And focus on hundreds and hundreds of ceramic pots that might one day become a masterpiece. So in other words, try, fail, learn, and repeat.
and just do that over and over and over again. Don't be afraid of making a load of rubbish. This is my favorite part. Be afraid of making nothing at all. So with that, I leave you. I, I hear there's a big bell that's about to ring and, and you're all gonna scatter away. So I um, would like to thank you all for having me here today. It's truly been a pleasure. And uh, hopefully we have a few minutes for a question or two. Thank you very much. <laughs>